We're going to be telling you about the Interplanetary Transport Network. This is a dynamical systems point of view of some fast mechanisms for transport through the solar system. Let me begin by talking about a comet. This is Comet Oterma, seen in an inertial frame as it has an encounter with Jupiter, goes into an orbit interior to Jupiter, and then has another encounter and goes to the outside. We see more structure when we look in a co-rotating frame with Jupiter on the right-hand side. And we see that the comet goes from the outside of Jupiter to inside, being temporarily captured both times. These green trajectories that it's on are related to this vast network of pathways winding through the solar system that we've termed the Interplanetary Transport Network. The way we view this is by considering just the res restricted few body problem. We're going to look at the chaotic transport of small bodies via the Hamiltonian flow that arises from the three body problem. This could be due to a point mass or a general gravity potential. It's a pretty low dimensional system, four dimensions to six dimensions. We'll be considering phase space structures that mediate the transport. The two main varieties are tube and lobe dynamics. And then we'll use approximate statistical models that might be appropriate. These are common in chemistry, and they look at phase space volumes. Let's consider the scattered Kuiper belt objects. This is a view in the inertial frame. If we look at it in terms of semi-major axis and orbital eccentricity, I've shown some of the scattered Kuiper belt objects as black stars and Tisserand parameters. These Tisserand parameters correspond to energy levels of the restricted three-body problem for the object in the field of the Sun and Neptune. So let's review quickly the restricted three-body approximation. There's a test particle P in the field of two massive bodies, M1 and M2. And we usually consider this not in an inertial frame, but in a rotating frame where the small x axis goes from m1 to m2. So we're looking in a, the motion of the test particle in this co-rotating frame. The equations of motion in this rotating frame describe the particle as moving in an effective potential plus a Coriolis force. This is the Hamiltonian for the simplest version of the problem. It's the two degree of freedom, so planar problem. The test particle is restricted to the orbital plane of m1 and m2. We've got the uh, conjugate momenta, and then we have the effective potential, which we plotted previously. This is in a non-dimensional form, where the only parameter is mu. This is the mass ratio of the smaller mass, m2, to the sum of the two masses. And in the solar system, this can be anywhere from 10 to the negative 6 to 10 to the negative 2. We consider motion on energy surfaces, or energy shells, to borrow language from chemistry. These are co-dimension one surfaces. So in the two degree of freedom problem, we have three dimensional energy surfaces foliating the four dimensional phase space. Recent work suggests that motion on large portions of the energy surface are nearly ergodic. That is, we have a large connected chaotic sea. And we can compute a distribution function of some variable of interest. For example, the semi-major axis. For the uh, energy shells, that correspond to the scattered Kuiper belt objects, I've shown a phase space average in red and a time average in blue. These are very close, which means we've got a nearly ergodic situation. This arises from the chaotic C on energy shells in that three-body problem. We can apply this for other systems, such as the Jupiter family comets, where we're looking at a test particle in the field of the Sun and Jupiter. The actual comet data is shown as the bars, and the theory that comes looking at just a, an energy surface is shown in red. We can also apply the statistical theory to Earth and Mars encountering asteroids. But let's focus a bit on the motion in this uh, energy surface. If we look at one of the resonances, we've got a resonance here, we have lobes that are entering or exiting this resonance region. And this is a well-known mechanism called turnstile lobes or lobe dynamics. And it 
is a, uh, a dynamical systems mechanism for how test particles would get around a resonance and pass through it. Typically, a test particle will encounter multiple resonances, and we would have motion that, at least on a Poincaré section, would look like something on the left, and a schematic is shown on, on the right as the test particle basically moves around regions of stable mean motion resonances. So it seems that some minor body populations live in chaotic sets, that is mixing regions of the phase space. And the motion is determined partly by this lobe dynamics. But we want to know how do objects either encounter or collide with planets and encounter sort of like what we saw with Oterma at the beginning. And that's where we need to go to this area called tube dynamics. And we look at connectivity of the energy surface. We describe the connectedness of the motion in terms of realms. The energy surface is partitioned into three realms. So for example, a test particle in the field of the Earth and the Moon is partitioned into a Earth realm completely around the Earth, a Moon realm completely around the Moon, and then one that's external to both of them that we call the exterior realm. And it's the energy, the Hamiltonian energy of the three-body problem that determines the connectivity. So for the lowest energy case, all three realms are disconnected. And as we increase in energy, the realms start connecting up. The realm around M1 connects with M2 first. And then all three realms connect until there is no more gray region. The gray region here corresponds to an energetically forbidden region where you have it would have negative kinetic energy, so it's just not possible. We have transit through those neck regions that open up, particularly around L1 and L2. These are two key Lagrange points that, for example, in, the, in a test particle in the field of a sun and a planet, they open up on either side of the planet. And it's their periodic and quasi-periodic orbits around these unstable Lagrange points and their invariant manifolds that play a key role in this fast transport mechanism. So we've got bound orbits around both L1 and L2, and we have stable and unstable manifolds that are winding onto and off of them, shown in the schematic here. These are just made up of individual trajectories winding onto and off of these unstable bound orbits. In the phase space, or more specifically on an energy surface, these tubes are hypercylinders that separate inside and outside of the tube. If an initial condition is inside the tube, then it passes through from one realm to another, say from the Sun realm to the Jupiter realm to beyond. If an initial condition is outside the tube, then it approaches one of these bound orbits around a Lagrange point, and it bounces back. So we can consider how this tube structure affects the motion of things in the solar system. We have planetary and sun realms connected by tubes, which if you were to project just onto the position space, you would see tubes appearing as strips. But up in the three-dimensional energy surface, at least for the planar problem, with the tubes really are cylinders going from one side of a neck to another. In the full three degree of freedom system, these tubes are actually four dimensional, not just two dimensional cylinders, but hyper cylinders that are separatrices in the 5D energy surface, meaning they separate qualitatively different kinds of behavior, going through, bouncing back. And these are what control or mediate temporary capture of a test particle around the smaller mass. These tubes are very general. They're a consequence of the Lagrange points being an index one saddle. That means they have a particular stability type where they have a single unstable direction, a single stable direction, and the rest are neutrally stable or center directions that correspond to oscillatory motion. They are ubiquitous in chemistry and are related to reaction rates that are often viewed along potential energy surfaces. We've found numerically and proven in some cases that these tubes persist when you add an additional massive body, or for example, when one adds other perturbations to the planar circular restricted three body problem, such as including eccentricity or other time periodic perturbations. And indeed, they've been observed in the solar system. We've even seen them on galactic and atomic scales. The way that we usually compute them is we use a method of a Poincaré surface of section. So we take a slice of the energy surface that tubes intersect, usually more than one tube, and see how they 
connect up. When there are regions that have a common behavior, we can label those using itineraries. And often this is done by looking on Poincaré surfaces of section where tubes intersect from either the same system or more than one system. For example, let's construct an itinerary that's the same as Oterma. We would label this itinerary XJS. It starts in the exterior realm, the X realm, goes to the Jupiter realm, and ends up in the Sun realm, at least for the first part of its journey. So we consider how the tubes connect on different Poincaré surfaces of section. And in this particular case, we'll look at U3. This is where an unstable manifold from L2 intersects a stable manifold from L1. Just isolating that portion, we can label these tubes. This is TXJ. It's currently in the J realm and it came from the X realm. This green tube, it's JS, where it's currently in the J realm and it's going to the S realm. If we look at what's happening along this Poincaré section here, we're looking at the interior of two tubes. So if you take a slice of something that is topologically a cylinder, you will get something that is topologically a circle. So we have these regions that we can label, and we want to look at the intersection region. So let's just zoom in on that, and we have a natural way of labeling this. So this is called tiling the phase space and labeling it. So this is XJS. It's currently in the J realm, came from X, and it's going to S. If we take that initial condition, and numerically integrate it forward and backward in our equations of motion, we get the behavior that Oterma does during the first part of its journey. Now let's go back to that tile that said XJS. If we follow tubes for longer and look at intersections after a longer time, we get smaller regions of phase space. In this case, if we added, think of the word XJS and we added two letters to the end, J and J, we get a smaller tile of phase space, all of the initial conditions in that small tile will have the same behavior. We look at initial conditions in that region, follow them forward and backward, and we can construct any type of itinerary. And because these are open sets in phase space, that means mathematically any nearby initial condition will have the same behavior. So these should be robust to perturbation. What I showed before was in the two degree of freedom system where we had a two dimensional Poincaré section, but we can extend this arbitrarily, but the next step up would be the three degree of freedom system where we have a four dimensional Poincaré section viewed here in terms of two projections, the projection in the Y and Z portions of phase space. They will be initial conditions that could be followed forward and backward and we get the same type of behavior. So we have systematic ways to construct these things. Now let me discuss some of the statistical approaches, particularly using tube dynamics. We want to use a statistical approach from chemistry called transition state theory to estimate the escape rate of Mars asteroids or ejecta that's around Mars but has an energy to escape towards the sun, we want to get an idea of how quickly does it escape. We call the first intersection of a stable manifold as the exit because anything that approaches this on a Poincaré section will then exit to the sun realm. We are making a mixing assumption, which is common in chemistry, which is that all asteroids in this chaotic sea surrounding Mars are equally likely to escape. Using transition state theory, we get a escape rate constant. This is similar to a reaction rate constant in chemistry, which is related just to the ratio of two areas on the Poincaré section, the area of the exit sunward, which is shown here in red, and the area of the chaotic sea in black. The ratio of those two can be related to this escape rate constant, and we can look at how the survival of an asteroid around Mars is related to the number of periods, so time. A Monte Carlo simulation that used 100,000 initial conditions is shown in the, the dashed line. And then the theory from transition state theory is shown as a solid line. You see there's really good agreement. We can look at other things such as temporary capture around a planet this is a kind of scattering problem where let's say something comes in, is temporarily captured. We want to know how long is it captured in terms of the number of loops and time before escaping. Again, we use these tubes and look at their intersections, look at multiple in intersections. Over time, we get these bands and it's the ratio of the bands that can tell us things. And it shows us that these capture times are profiled. So we I give a couple of examples here for a high energy. This is the probability of being captured uh, for a certain number of loops. 
and then this shows kind of continuous time, and then low energy. The highest probability is just one loop, and then strangely, there's a peak at four, et cetera. We can also look at problems involving more than one three-body problem where we use this idea of tube hopping. This could be related to ejected transfer between planets, for example, between Mars and the Earth, where we would look at, on a common Poincaré section, the amount escaping via a tube and the amount that will be entering via another tube, and that would be the transported fraction. One could look at other things such as comet transfer between planets, such as comets that may change control in the sense of which three-body problem is the most dominant between Saturn and Jupiter. If one considers a test particle being passed between several different three-body systems via these L1 and L2 Lagrange point manifolds, then there are lanes of fast transport across the solar system. Shown here in green and black are the energy surface is closely related to the L1 and L2 manifolds for the giant planets, and this becomes a way to quickly go from one side of the solar system to the other. The details of how transport occurs between realms and even collision can be related to these phase volume calculations of probability. So if we were to look at an Oterma-like transition, we would consider the tubes related to that and then calculate the ratio of the intersection area, shown here in yellow, with the direction, whether from the interior or exterior of Jupiter's orbit. And of course, we're making a well-mixed assumption, similar to what's done in chemistry, but we can calculate transition probabilities as a function of the three-body energy, or if you want, the uh, Jacobi constant or Tisserand parameter. So here we've shown the probability of a transition from one side of Jupiter to the other, either coming from the L1 direction or L2, and we're overlaying the energy range for Oterma. And you see it's in the range where there's about 20% probability, definitely non-zero. We can also consider collisions, since these tubes will intersect the planet. These would be the lowest velocity impacts that are possible. So we assume that an object enters the planetary region with an energy slightly above L1 or L2, for example, Shoemaker-Levy 9 in its 1994 collision. So we just basically look at how the tube intersects the planet, and that becomes a probability. We take that area and compare it to the area of the tube itself, and we can get probabilities in this case for collisions with Jupiter family comets with Jupiter coming from either the L1 or L2 direction, and we've overlaid the energy range for Shoemaker-Levy 9, which happens to be in the range of highest probability. So there's systematic ways to compute these probabilities. One of the really nice aspects of this theory, since it's related to general phase-space structures in Hamiltonian systems, is we can relate it to experimental systems, tabletop experimental systems that are easily accessible, like a ball rolling on an interesting potential energy surface with saddle points in, in between. Unlike dynamical astronomy, where it's hard to set up experiments, for this situation, we can easily release several different initial conditions and do statistics on how well the tube dynamics works. And in this case, we get a validation of the tube dynamics theory and also transition fractions, probabilities as a function of energy above the saddle. Some final words. We've reviewed that there, there really is an interplanetary transport network, and it's related to these dynamical systems structures, so the phase space geometry as well as the statistics related to that geometry, we're pretty low dimensional system. There's interesting relationships between the connected chaotic sets and the probability of finding an object at a particular location. There's transport via tubes and lobes. We can also relate these to things like ejection and collision and also use statistical ideas from chemistry. Just some selected references here of recent papers in this area. The most valuable thing might be a book that's available, open access, that you could download from my website.